Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International European Affairs in Dublin. Uh, you're most most welcome, and we're delighted to be joined today by Dr. Manuel Sean Quinlevin, Lecturer in European Politics at UCC. And Dr. Sean Quinlevin is going to speak to us about France's 2023 in review and what to expect in 2024. This is our last webinar of, of many webinars of 2023, so I want to thank all of our speakers and all of our participants for the great ideas that have been shared and the great discussions we've had. Dr. Sean Quinlevin will speak for the customary 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to the Q&A with you, our audience. As ever, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And as ever, please be minded that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Please feel free to join the discussion as well on at the artist formerly known as Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Dr. Sean Quinlevin and hand over to her. Dr. Manuel Sean Quinlevin is a lecturer in European politics in the Department of Government at University College Cork, UCC. She was awarded a Jean Monnet Chair in Active European Citizenship in 2021 and a Jean Monnet Teaching Teacher Training Grant, one of only 20 that were delivered Europe-wide in 2022. She teaches European policymaking and institutional politics, as well as French politics. And she's the director of UCC's hub in Active European Citizenship. Manuel, thanks as ever for being with us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. So let me just share my screen. I have a PowerPoint uh, for the presentation today. Um, there we are. Um, so I'm actually particularly pleased to be invited this week because, um, as you know, uh, there's been a lot of drama in France um, in, in the last few days. So I wanted to give you an overview of what um, Macron's second mandate has been like so far. Um, it's only been 18 months and it feels like five years already. Um, and um, as Barry said, uh, maybe suggest a few things that will happen uh, for the rest of the mandate. Now, let me see how I move on. Uh, yes, okay. So um, I'm going to look at things politically, socially and economically, or economically and socially. So politically, I'm going to bring you back to June 2022, just to remind ourselves that uh, Emmanuel Macron <clears throat> got, he, he was elected uh, in April, but by June, he only uh, achieved a relative majority in the uh, legislative election. So he got 246 seats out of 577. The magic number is uh, 200 and, uh, 289 to have an overall majority. So he was short 43 seats. Since then, it's become 45 seats because some have moved. Um, and he honestly, I think, didn't ex expect it at all. He was in this mold of thinking, I won the presidential elections, you know, the legislative elections are uh, just uh, two months later. Um, there's no way I, I'm not going to get an overall majority. So that was a shock to his system and I think to um, the, the people around him. Um, I remember very well that Roland Carroll, who is a very esteemed political scientist who teaches in Sciences Po, at the time was invited a lot in different um, TV programs to explain what uh, what that meant and how, um, you know, what, what would happen. And he clearly explained that you had so many European countries that could function um, with uh, coalitions or even, um, uh, you know, minority governments and they struck compromises and all this could happen in France. There was no reason why France was unable to achieve this. Well, clearly, after 18 months uh, of uh, the Bonn government, uh, the clear conclusion is that it's it's not in the uh, French political culture. Um, and the example of the immigration bill is um, that that just uh, happened a, a few days ago is uh, is very clear uh, is a testimony to this. It's actually surprising that it didn't happen before. But that's because the government has used an article in the French constitution, which is Article 49.3, which allows the government for specific bills uh, to uh, avoid uh, a debate in uh, in the parliament and uh, put 
uh, the, the the bill to avoid um, engaging it or, or committing it, the its uh, confidence basically. Uh, so if you vote, if, if the parties uh, vote no to to this bill, then uh, the government falls. So the uh, Article forty nine point three has been used uh, twenty. Uh, times, as you can see in the diagram on the right there, um, Elizabeth Bourne Bor until this month has used it 20 times, has faced 27 motions of no confidence, of censure, uh, that were all defeated. Um, and she is only 18 months into uh, the mandate. Uh, Michel Rocard here, over three years, faced 28 motions of no confidence. Um, uh, sorry, 28, um, sorry, he used uh, the 49.3 uh, article 28 times, but faced only five motions of uh, no confidence. Um, I want to say a few words just on the dynamic of oppositions in the uh, National Assembly. Um, it's divided into um, three different types of oppositions. So you have NUPES, which includes the Socialist, the Greens and uh, La France Insoumise. Um, and then you have LR, who are the Conservatives, and Rassemblement, Rassemblement National, who are the former Front National. Um, and I've categorized them as radical. So NUPES has been radical, extremely vocal, um, I would say um, offensive in uh, the way they have approached their political exchanges and political work. Um, LR um, is in an existential position um, so well, I'll come back to this because Emmanuel Macron really thought that, and, and a lot of his uh, political heavyweights thought that they could count on LR. Uh, but as we saw with the immigration bill, um, that didn't work out. And LR is in a position, and which was indicated very early on by their leader, Olivier Marlet, that um, like they, they weren't going to um, be the crutch for Emmanuel Macron because that would be the end of them. And then Rassemblement National, you might be surprised that I kind of categorized them as professional. They have acted in a more professional way than they've ever acted before. It's the largest group of um, Rassemblement National uh, MPs we've ever had. And compared with LFE and uh, PS and Greens, but particularly LFE, the, the, the larger uh, composition um, of uh, or the la larger member of NUPES, um they have been um relatively professional <laughs> and um restrained and they have worked on their files and they have worked the system more strategically to get certain positions in the national assembly so um they've certainly professionalized all this with the perspective of 2027 so um, what's on the agenda until 2027, we have, uh, and this is what Emmanuel Macron has pointed uh, towards, um, the in, enshrining the right to abortion in uh, the constitution that came very much into the discussion after the Roe v. Wade uh, overturn in uh, uh, the US. Um, so, but it's still in, in, in discussion and on the agenda. Uh, the extension of the scope uh, in the use of the referendum, um, it's very limited compared with uh, what you have in Ireland. So um, it's in the 1958 original constitution, we had the use of referendum for the structuring of public institutions and the ratification of international treaties. Then in 1995, Chirac extended it to economic and social policy. And then in 2008, uh, Sarkozy extended it to environmental issues. The problem with amendments to the constitution is that uh, Emmanuel Macron needs a certain number of, um, you know, a certain level of majorities and et cetera. He wouldn't have three fifths of the two, the two uh, institutions, Senate and National Assembly, so the parliament. Um, so he, he, it would be uh, quite, um, a quite, 
a high hurdle to to strike. Um, when you look at the immigration legislation, it is still on the agenda. It has now moved towards the Commission Mix Paritaire, which includes seven MPs and seven uh, senators, um, because it was defeated before even being debated. That was a, a huge um, uh, defeat for uh, the interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, who uh, is a political heavyweight, um, you know, Macron's government has often been criticized for, or yeah, criticized for being uh, low in political heavyweights and uh, ra rather uh, heavy on civil society or technic uh, technicians as such. But people who don't have a political know-how, uh, Jal Damana certainly have a political know-how, but uh, he didn't manage to convince his LR where he comes from, actually, the party he comes from, his LR uh, colleagues uh, to support the uh, legislation. All that because what came out of the Senate um, that had been amended by the, the group there, uh, the LR group there that has the majority, was undone largely by the National Assembly and Gérald Darmanin didn't like said that both versions were, were very good and etc. So it was very confusing. Um, but this is uh, a legislation that will remain on the agenda um, and it cannot go to the 49.3 article uh, because it is uh, covering too many uh, areas in justice and civil matters and etc. So uh, it doesn't fit into the areas I've just outlined. Um, uh, Gabriel Attal, who is the new Minister for Education, uh, has started, uh, kick-started um, a reform of uh, education in France. And on the right there, I've uh, put a, a table from the recent PISA um, analysis. And I know PISA is criticized, but nonetheless, it's kind of the reference uh, for, uh, for when it comes to education. Um, and you can see that uh, quite consistently, the level of 15-year-old uh, students in France, when it comes to uh, mathematics, reading and science, is declining. Um, and that has been uh, the subject of discussion for a long time, actually. Uh, and Gabriel Attal is now um, kind of trying to tackle this. So it's his main focus. Gabriel Attal is seen as the shining star of the Macroni, as they say, um, the, the potential successor to Emmanuel Macron. Um, he has done very well in his previous positions and um, he was picked as a very young Minister for Education and a lot of ex is expected of him actually so uh something to follow because this will be important as well and it's linked to what i'm going to say at the social level uh and finally the end of life legislation will be presented in february 2024 it follows um a kind of french version of the citizens assembly um it uh, divides the government but also uh lr is against what the citizens assembly has recommended so um we'll have to see what the government uh comes up with uh but this is uh, a key social legislation that uh will certainly uh come before the the national representation now our options in terms of the um the political kind of crisis that um france is facing with uh the 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 rejection of uh the debate on the um immigration legislation there are different options um we can do nothing but i don't think that's what Emmanuel Macron has in mind. Uh, we have discussed a lot dissolving the National Assembly. He's rejected, rejected this option. There's a potential of a large reshuffle of the government, including a change of prime minister. His issue there is um, I, what, who would be the potential candidates? Um, and then a small reshuffle, reshuffle of the government with no change of prime minister that would um, that has already happened. It could happen again. Gérald Darmanin has offered his resignation, which was rejected by uh, Emmanuel Macron, but that could still be, um, a, you know, uh, an option. Um, a proper coalition government with uh, LR. 
um, which is what LR wants. It doesn't want to just prop up the government. It wants to be um, uh, allied in a in a coalition with the government and get uh, posts, but also items of their program onto the agenda. And um, and then the, the 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 one that has also been mentioned. Um, by some, so you know how governments put out little feelers like this, uh, the same way there was a suggestion that Macron wanted to change the constitution in order to circumvent the restriction to two mandates uh, that was put out by his, um, oh, I, I can't remember the name of his uh, very faithful friend, but uh, it got a bad reaction. So I was withdrawn from the discussion, but Macron could resign and run again in 2027 potentially. Um, I don't think that's the way it's going. Um, the, we're, we're going either for uh, a reshuffle, um, large or small. Now, from a social point of view, um, France is very much um, at a point of eruption. Um, it's it's um, we, we have seen a constant increase in attacks against upholders of authority like policemen, gendarmes, uh, doctors, teachers. So not only people who represent the state, the state per se, but as I said, doctors, uh, teachers, firefight, fa firefighters have been attacked. Um, uh, you know, the, sorry, attacks on firefighters have increased uh, from 899 in 2008 to 3,400 in 2018, um, which shows um, it's one example only of uh, the increase in attacks on um, people of authority. We've had a murder of a teacher in the school in Ahas in October 2023. Um, sorry, and that was three years after the beheading of Samuel Paty outside his school. We've had the murder of a Spanish teacher in April 23 as well, both for different reasons, but it's just this level of violence um, that is increasing in society. And that um, has led to a discussion um, started by Jérôme Fourquet, who's a really interesting political scientist and analyst. Um, and um, he's he's talked about a process of decivilization. So he's he's taken Norbert uh, Elias's um, description of a process of civilization, which led to the appeasement of social norms where violence wasn't the recourse um, to solve issues, but people, you know, there was an increase in civility and being courteous. Um, there was also, um, he also highlighted the significance of language in the process of civilization. And in contrast, Jérôme Fouquet has highlighted how um, we have, well, he's, he thinks we've entered a process of decivilization where we've moved um, from, you know, the, a pre-1960s France to a child-centric France where education has changed quite significantly to now a very customer-centric uh, France where there is a decreasing level of acceptance of obstacles to our desires. Um, if you look uh, to the uh, graph on the right, um, he's um, put together the, the this graph, like he works for EFOP, and um, the consequence, the psychological consequences to consumption or non-consumption. Like the older you are, the more likely you are to be just resigned, like you don't have the means to buy the iPhone 15 Z or whatever it is. Um, but that's fine because you have the iPhone 11 and you're happy with that. And the younger you are, the more you feel this is your entitlement. And if you don't get that, you are frustrated, not just resigned. Um, so uh, Jean Fourquet insists on child centricity, um, the, the increase in consumerism in French society, uh, the end to the influence of the church, which even post 1960s, you know, like in the 70s were around 35%, and the end to civic education in uh, school, which is a also a significant topic of discussion uh, regarding a uh, change in programs, a uh, change in curriculum in France to bring back, um, you know, uh, lessons on morality and 
um, civic um, action and etc. Um, I wanted to take this example because I know it is something that has been discussed in Ireland, the impact on local representatives, the level of violence, because at the end of the day, you know, um, it's it's our uh, political representatives, democratically elected representatives on the ground that are the first uh, port of call when it comes to this level of violence. So on the left, you have Yannick Morez, who's the mayor of Saint-Brévin, um, whose house and cars were burnt down after the state decided to move a refugee centre from uh, another locality to his um, uh, town, um, and to uh, set it up next to a school. Um, that was on the 22nd of March this year. On the 1st of July, after um, Nael, uh, who was a young um, man, was killed by policemen during um, a checkup, uh, a road checkup, um, the Vincent Jeanbrun, who uh, is a mayor of Les Les Roses, not at all where Niall was killed, but Niall's um, death led to uh, riots all across uh, France. Um, Vincent Jeanbrun uh, wasn't actually um, in his house, but his house and his car were set up on fire and his wife and two kids escaped just uh, at the last minute from there. His wife was injured. Um, and this highlights, um, you know, what Civi what Civic Puff has uh, showed uh, that 39% uh, of mayors have received verbal or written threats, which is an increase of 11% on 2020. Uh, that was in 2022. In 2022, you had 37% of mayors uh, that mentioned uh, that uh, there was uh, they had received insults or abuse, an increase of 8%, and 63% uh, were victims of antisocial behavior from rudeness, rudeness to physical abuse. So again, this uh, our local representatives are those that are uh, the most affected and are the first to uh, to be um, kind of affected. Um, from an econo economic point of view, um, you know, we've I've only known France for with mass unemployment like since the 1970s ma uh, france has known mass unemployment where other european countries were able to they had their ups and downs but they were able to kind of uh find solutions to unemployment uh france never did until very recently and under macron uh not only because of macron it started under Hollande and etc but um we went from 3 million unemployed in 2015 to 2.2 million in 2022. So we went from 9% to 7% of unemployment. And now Macron is aiming for 5% of unemployment, which would be uh, full employment levels. Um, but, and you would think, well, because for years, the main uh, issue uh, that voters had was the level of unemployment, that um, there, there would be some satisfaction with um, the economic results um, that Macron has um, achieved or were achieved under Macron's uh, government. Um, but we're, we're not there uh, at all. The uh, people still feel because of uh, inflation, like every country that, uh, you know, they're, they're not, uh, their quality of life has uh, declined. Um, at a macro level, there's uh, a main economic issue, which is the level of public expenditure and public debt. So public debt, if you look at the uh, graph on the, or the map, sorry, on the right, uh, you see that France is among the uh, most uh, publicly indebted countries with 111% of GDP, uh, compared with an average of 90% in the EU, and our Ireland is at 43%. Um, so the, 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 there's an issue about, um, you know, this uh, public debt and how it's going to be repaid, particularly with the increase in interest rates uh, in the ECB uh, or by the ECB. Um, but overall, there's this, there's this feeling that French growth, economic growth and French economic performances are stagnating now. And that certainly the aim of full employment um, is, um, is kind of... Uh, uh, 
in the rear view mirror now. Uh, the level of public expenditure, uh, well, I think the graph says it all, quite honestly. France is right at the top and Ireland is right at the bottom. Um, so um, the problem that is that French people have consistently highlighted through COVID, but even before COVID, is that we have a high level of public expenditure financed by a high level of taxation for declining for the for public services that are declining in quality so education pisa studies uh, you know year after year time after time show that french students perform less and less well our health system is beyond creaking at the seams we had doctors and nurses in the streets repeatedly um the, the the conditions of hospitals is just appalling or of a lot of them is is just appalling they're 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 very much struggling public transportation you will have you know in regions um people complaining about uh you know the punctuality of uh, of trains uh the quality of trains etc um police uh you have police stations that are getting closed down and etc to to try and save up money um but people are unhappy about this so um i wanted to mention a study that is a little bit old but christophe guy uh in la france périphérique highlighted how there's a link between the closing of rural public services like post offices or police stations and um an increase in the vote for the rassemblement national so the further away you are from a post office a police station or a kind of um regional train station the more likely so removed from state public services uh the more likely you vote for the uh, rassemblement national uh, I'm going to finish up with the in, an, an international look at Macron's achievements. Um, I'll, I'll start with the Spiegel. So <laughs> France was, I mean, France, I don't know, uh, on Twitter and France elites were really delighted with this uh, Spiegel article, um, which was uh, about um, France, but was a better Deutschland, it was a better, sorry. France was Germany, but better. Um, so was trying to do the same as Germany, but better. Because for years, uh, France was regarded as um, kind of below Germany. And this uh, journalist uh, highlighted how uh, France had better economic growth, had increased competitiveness, whereas the competitiveness of Germany was declining, had higher uh, forest direct investment, that uh, the price of electricity in France was half the price of Germany's, and that actually uh, it had a bigger influence on the European stage. Um, the bigger influence on the European stage uh, can be largely discussed, uh, but the Spiegel's or this particular uh, analysis, certainly Sophie Bader in The um, Economist would ha has you know, uh, argued the same for quite a while. Um, now, Macron, I'll tell you, within France, has been criticised for his discussions with Putin, Putin and uh, the reluctance to enlarge the European Union until recently. He lost the support uh, of uh, uh, many Central and Eastern European countries uh, are doing that. Now, he's changed his tack a bit now and has stopped his discussions uh, with Putin and, as we know, has supported the enlargement to uh, Ukraine and uh, etc. But for a while, uh, that was really uh, heavily criticised. Um, he's struggling because there's no high profile candidate uh, from Ensemble, which is the new um, you know, coalition of uh, of three parties um, in which En Marche is. Um, but there's no high profile candidate for the European elections in June 2024. So he has Stéphane Séjourné, but Stéphane Séjourné doesn't have, you know, the again, this high prof high political profile to um, to carry out uh, um, a flamboyant European campaign, because at the end of the day, Macron has always been the pro-European candidate um so you would expect uh a, a a very um positive dynamic campaign and we're seven months out and we have no head of the list um we he is um 
obviously uh, for quite a focus quite a bit on the Olympic Games in August 2024. Uh, lots of question marks on security on this one. Um, and uh, the opening ceremony is meant to be uh, absolutely amazing, but I can tell you that uh, the police um, is is uh, still in negotiations with him to try and find another way of doing it, not by the send like this, because it is um, impossible to secure. So um, I'm not in the secrets of the gods, but uh, I know this is um, still problematic. Um, once the European elections are, have passed and the uh, Olympic Games are uh, completed, uh, no matter how either go uh, goes, that's when the candidates for the 2027 presidential elections will start positioning themselves. Gérald Darmanin, who was a potential candidate, has declared recently that he would go according to what opinion polls, um, how opinion polls were placing, uh, and he would support who, whoever was best placed, which at the moment is Edouard Philippe, um, but that can change, of course. Um, so the question is, what will Macron's legacy be? Um, you know, I remember in 2017, he delivered this inspiring, I thought, um, a speech in La Sorbonne, but what, what has happened since then, um, you could say very little. So that's it.